Welcome everybody. This is lesson number two in this Bible study series we are calling Unlocking the Old Testament. This is a study of some of the big picture, uh, uh, big picture uh, stories from the Old Testament and looking at them specifically through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are literally unlocking some of the deeper meanings of these stories. Uh, there is a listening guide for this lesson. You'll find it the same place you found this video. Just scroll down and click on that link and download that PDF to your computer so that you can print it out. There are some blanks to fill in during the teaching portion of the lesson, and then there are some discussion questions there for you and your small group to go through after the lesson. Uh, you will also need your Bible or your Bible app open today to Genesis chapter uh, 22. Uh, Genesis chapter 22, we're going to be looking at the story of Abraham and Isaac today. Before we jump into the lesson, let's pray, shall we? Father, we want to understand uh, these stories um, on an even deeper level than we've ever understood them before. Uh, we need so badly your direction and your guidance in this broken world, this chaotic world that we live in with so much pain and so much suffering. We need your guidance, and we know that we get that through your word. And so, yes, Father, our prayer is that even today, as we open your word, that you will open our hearts and that you will give us that guidance, that you will, that you will change how we understand who you are, uh, that you'll change how we even see ourselves and how we see the world around us, how we see other people. We, we pray, Father, that you will deepen our faith, grow our faith, and continue the transformation process in our lives, changing us more and more into the people that you've called us to become. That's what we desire, Lord. Will you do that today? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We said uh, last week that uh, good Christian theology, good Christian theology doesn't begin with creation and work its way up to Jesus. Rather, Good Christian theology literally begins with Jesus and works its way out. And so what we're doing in this series is we are looking at some very familiar stories out of the Old Testament, stories that you may well have heard from when you were children, I mean, from when we were kids, stories that we're very familiar with, but we're changing the lens that we're looking, looking at them through. We are now looking at them through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we're seeing the same gospel message in each of these stories. We're seeing that, re that story of redemption. We started last week uh, with the story of Noah and Noah's Ark, and uh, this week we're going to be looking in Genesis chapter 22 uh, at the story of Abraham and his son Isaac and Abraham's great faith and his obedience. The two questions that we're asking week after week is, number one, why is this story in the Bible? What are we supposed to take away from the story? But number two, the deeper meaning, uh, how does Jesus and his gospel message help us better understand this story when we look at it through that lens? Uh, today, like I said, we're going to be looking at the story of Abraham, the father of a nation. Uh, we're going to be looking at his story of faith and obedience, a, a specific instance from his story of faith and obedience. Um, of course, the whole scripture makes much of Abraham's faith. It, it re refers to it often. Today's lesson, though, is what most of us would think of as the ultimate test of Abraham's faith. Uh, just to kind of give us a running start into where we pick up the story today, let's, let's go back and let me just kind of bring you up to speed in Abraham's life. Uh, Abraham is someone who Scripture refers to as a friend of God. And in Genesis chapter 12, here's what it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt, and all the families on earth will be blessed through you. Now this this was said to a man who at that point in, in time had zero children and was just a guy, right? But he had, there was something special about his faith, about his desire to walk with God, about his belief and trust in God. And so Abram left, Abraham left his father, 
Uh, it would take him some years to actually separate from his father, he, but he did eventually leave. His father passed away, and it was really because of his father's death that Abraham was finally able to pull away, but he separated from his father because of his father's death. The next thing that he was called upon to do in his journey of faith with God is he was, he was called to separate from his nephew Lot, who was like a son to him, very close to him. Uh, and he was reluctant to separate from his, from his nephew Lot, but he did do that. And so we have him first separating from his father and leaving, and then separating from his nephew Lot. And the next thing that would happen was uh, his son Ishmael. His son Ishmael was not born to his wife Sarah, but was born to his wife's servant. Uh, given this promise that God had given to Abraham and Sarah that they would be, he, Abraham would be the father of a nation, and yet by the time they were very old, Sarah was still barren and not having children, and so they took matters into their own hands, and Sarah gave Abraham her servant to have a child with, uh, with her servant, and they called that son Ishmael. Uh, that did not please God either, and it, it, Abraham had to send Ishmael and his mother away and so that was yet the, another separation, another separation that God called him to. Painful act of sending his son away. Um, and, and eventually, though, God did miraculously provide a son through Sarah, even though she was 90 years old at the time. He, he, she became pregnant and gave birth to their son Isaac. Uh, so it was their only son at this point. And this son Isaac was the last hope that they had for God to fulfill this promise that through them they would, he would create a great nation. So that's where we pick up this story with them holding on to this last hope in their son Isaac whom they loved. And this is where it goes uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 22 beginning with verse 1. After these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am, and he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took it in his hand, he took in his hand the fire and the knife, and they both went up together. All right. This request from God, frankly, has been the subject of much debate among scholars over the centuries. Lots of questions among scholars re, uh, regarding how could God ask Abraham to do something that God would specifically prohibit as an immoral act in other instances. Uh, the, the, the notion of sacrificing children is, is spread throughout the scripture, and every time it's mentioned, it is mentioned with condemnation. It is something that did not honor God, that he does not want. And so how is it that God could now ask Abraham to do that very thing and to sacrifice his son for him, for God? That's a troublesome question. It's a troublesome question. Let's come back to that, though, shall we? So Abraham, it said, rose early in the morning. What does that mean? Well, I think it means, number one, immediate obedience. Uh, number two, there wasn't a whole lot of planning in this. He just obeyed. But maybe most importantly, number three, it probably means, at least the way I read this, it probably means he did not have a conversation with Sarah about this, with, with Isaac's mother, his wife. Uh, I don't think, I, I don't read this as Sarah even knowing that this was going on. Uh, I and the boy, he says, I and the boy, he says to the, the servant boys who are with him, I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Now this is, this is an expression, I think, of great hope and faith. What he's saying there is we, Isaac and I, will go and do this, and Isaac and I will come back to you. So there, that's a little bit of a hint there of, of how he was grounding his faith and what he was really believe in, believing in. We get more of an insight into this when we jump up to Hebrews chapter 11. Of course, Abraham, with this great faith, makes the all-star list 
in Hebrews chapter 11 of men and women of great faith. And what he says, what, what Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 11, verse 19, is Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in that sense, in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. So uh, I think that there is the, one way of looking at this is, yes, he, he fully intended to go through with this sacrifice, whether he understood it or not, but he knew that even if he did it, God would be able to raise Isaac from the dead. And so this comment, the boy and I will go and the boy and I will come back. Um, there are several answers then, let's circle back to that troubling question, why would God ask someone to do something that he has specifically forbidden and condemned in other places? And I'll just tell you honestly, there are several answers to that question, but none of them are all that satisfying to me personally. And so I, I still have this question a little bit rattling around in my heart and my mind. I don't have the answer to it, but here are what some of the scholars have said. Number one, God did not in fact allow Abraham to go through with it, so that's okay. Uh, that's one answer. Number two, God is incapable of evil, uh, right? And so being incapable of evil, there, somehow, some way, this is not wrong. We don't know how. We just trust that God has that figured out. Uh, and then number three, that God did not ask Abraham to do anything other than what God himself would eventually do with his own son. And this, this answer I'm intrigued by. This one, this one resonates with me a little bit more because uh, as we look at this story through the lens of Jesus, we, see a lot of, we begin to see a lot of similarities in terms of an only son being sacrificed. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that whoever believes in Him will not perish but will have everlasting life. So that idea of providing as a sacrifice my only Son for the benefit of others, uh, that's the same, the same picture that we're seeing here with Abraham and Isaac. So, so we would call that like a typological or typological significance to this story. And, and, and based upon that typological significance, we can see that God's command here has uh, a, a holy and pure purpose when we look at it through the lens of this is exactly, this is just a, an image, a mirror image of what later would happen with God's own son. Seeing this story through the lens of Jesus then, it helps us see a little bit of a new dimension to it, doesn't it? If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first statement on your listening guide. We step a little closer in our understanding of God's love for us when we fully engage the pain of sacrificing an only child. For God so loved the world. Uh, the, the, when, we, when we begin to read this story and put our place in, the, put, our, put ourselves in this story in place of Abraham, we begin to feel the tension and, and the grit, if you will, of understanding of the love of a father who would, who would do this for someone else's benefit. I think that's an important takeaway. Isaac then speaks up. I love this part. Isaac, in verse 7, it says, Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And, and Abraham said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? In other words, I see most of the pieces we need for this offering, but where is the lamb that's going to be offered? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Abraham did not lie. He was exactly right. God would provide that lamb. But I don't think Abraham knew when he spoke those words exactly how that was going to turn out. It is possible uh, that this story, as we're reading, it is kind of the Reader's Digest condensed version of everything that happened. I mean, this was a journey that took three days to get to the land of Moriah. Obviously, there would have been lots of other conversation and things that took place that, that are not included in here. Uh, Moses, in writing this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, only gives us what we need to know. So there may have been other conversations that, that make all of this seem more natural than it otherwise might. Uh, but the irony in this dialogue that we've just read is just is, is simply amazing to me. It's, it's thick, thick irony of the sacrifice himself asking, where's the lamb that's going to be sacrificed? I just, I think that's so poignant. Uh, 
was this question that Isaac asked, is it, is it completely innocent? Did he literally not have any idea or do you think there may have been some suspicion in it? Was there uh, some kind of some side eye looking, uh, dad, wh- wh- what's the sacrifice here? I don't know. We don't know the answer to that question because we don't have any of the context around it. But either way, it illustrates a really important reality for us about our own personal faith. And that is this, it may well, our own personal faith and obedience may well, probably will have an impact some consequences on those around us, particularly those closest to us. When I am, when my faith is strong and I am obeying, right, I'm obeying God's calling in my life and I'm obeying uh, what he's asked me to do, it's going to have an impact and consequences on the people close to me. When we look at Abraham's story through the lens of the gospel message, we see that it's the same way with following Jesus. When I'm following Jesus, my growing faith will necessarily have an impact on those around me. And it may, it may not be a welcomed impact. It may not be consequences that those people around me want to see or want to have happen in their lives. Um, when we look at this story through the lens of the gospel message in our own lives, we see this impact with much more clarity. Abraham's faith and obedience is about to have an impact on Isaac in a pretty big way, right? If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the next statement. Our faith and obedience in our walk with Christ will have an impact on those close to us. It may be welcomed, it may not be welcomed, but there will be an impact. All right, so we get then to Mount Moriah, verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac, in his, bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, uh, we believe, is the mount where the temple would eventually be built hundreds of years later. Uh, It is believed today to be what we know as the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Uh, And so it's an amazingly, unbelievably significant spiritual place for two different faiths, for two different religions, not only for the Christian religion, but for the Muslims as well. Uh, Abraham named the place Jehovah Jireh, God will provide, the Lord will provide, the Lord uh, will make available what we need because God provided the sacrificial lamb for his offering. It does seem important to note that God did not wave off the need for the sacrifice in this test. In other words, yes, this was a test of Abraham's faith, and when Abraham passed the test, the sacrifice still went through, just not the one that Abraham thought was going to go through. In other words, God didn't say, never mind, you don't have to do the sacrifice. No, the sacrifice still took place. He provided the ram for the sacrifice. But the big takeaway from this passage for me is that Abraham passes the test, and it raises an interesting question. Who was this test for? For whose benefit was this test? Was this God testing Abraham because God didn't know how Abraham would respond? Because God was somehow unsure of Abraham's faith? And is is he like this great professor, right? This great college professor in the sky who, who is trying to find out, have you learned anything? I need to figure out whether you're learning anything or not, so let's take a test. Or rather, was this test all along not for God's benefit, but for Abraham's benefit? I think it's that. I I don't think this is something that God did not know. I think that God, I'm sure that God already knew Abraham's heart. He already knew the extent of Abraham's faith. And in fact, in terms of the timeline, he had already seen the results of this test. 
when he asked Abraham to do this in the first place. So this wasn't for God's benefit. This was for Abraham's benefit. This was for Abraham to see something about himself. He had been asked to leave his father. He'd been asked to leave Lot. He'd been asked to leave Ishmael, his first son. Now he's being asked to give up his last and only son. This is the ultimate test of his faith. I think God wanted Abraham to know that he, was, that he has that kind of faith. It does say in the scripture, for now I know that you fear God. But does that mean God did not know? I don't think so. I don't think that's what it means at all. I think God knew before this. I believe the test was for Abraham's benefit. I believe it helped him come to an understanding that through experience, through actual experience uh, of what God knew all along, and that is that Abraham's faith in God was strong and was solid. Abraham seemed confident of this all along. He seemed confident, but you and I may be confident before it actually happens, but we don't actually know how we're going to respond until we're in the circumstance in many cases, right? So we think, we'd like to think we know how we would respond, but until we're there, we don't know for sure. God wanted Abraham to be there in the circumstance and to experience it. That's a 100% certainty at that point. The confidence level is higher than ever at that point. It's a whole different kind of confidence, quite frankly, once we've experienced it. Do any of us really know what kind of faith we have until we have walked through the experience that actually puts us to the test? And don't tests of our faith work that same way in, in our life? They're not for God's benefit so much, but they're, but they're really for our benefit. Tests of our faith are for our benefit, for us to learn from experience what our faith is is made of. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the third statement on your listening guide. When God tests our faith, it's not for His benefit. He already knows everything there is to know about our faith. Rather, it is for our own benefit that we might know how our own faith, we might know our own faith from experience. All right, so the last thing that happens after this test of Abraham's faith is God renews his covenant, that he has stated this promise that he's given Abraham several times up until this point in the story. Now he's going to renew it in terms of a covenant. Verse 15, And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn. When it says, By myself I have sworn, that means that in this instance, the angel of the Lord is actually God himself. The angel of the Lord, as it's referenced throughout the Old Testament, takes different forms. Sometimes it's God himself. Sometimes it seems to be a separate angel. In this case, clearly it's God himself. By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. All right, so as I mentioned, in this case, the angel of the Lord seems to be the Lord himself. Because Abraham did not withhold his only son, this story becomes this critical inflection point in God's story of redeeming this world. That's why we're looking at this story. The, the stories that we're looking at in the Old Testament are all big inflection points that that, that matter, that, that, that change the course in some regard, or that, that add some, some really important additional information to God's story. It parallels God's not withholding His own Son as the preeminent inflection point in God's story of redeeming the world. There's a lot of, there are a lot of parallels here between God not withholding His Son and, and Abraham not withholding His Son. God's previous versions of this promise, of the Abrahamic promise, were unconditional. They were not conditioned on anything. Um, it seemed in those previous promises that it truly was just a free gift to Abraham based on nothing Abraham did. But here, look what God says. God says, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And so, um, the promise had already been made. The grace was already in place, right? But what he's saying here is, and now you have demonstrated that faith and all the more makes me want to provide you with this blessing. So God's choice of Abraham included, his choice choosing Abraham included not only the end that God intended, that is the blessing of his life, but it also included the means through which that blessing would come, and that is through Abraham's 
faith, and his obedience. So like the gospel message, the blessings are the result of the obedience that comes from faith. Let me say that again. The blessings are the result of the obedience that comes from faith. Getting all of that in the right order is so critical. Uh, so our, our last fill in the blank is literally right out of Scripture. It is Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Here's what it sounds like. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Filling that blank. Through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So it is grace, faith, works or obedience, blessings. That's the order that we keep this in. So what are our takeaways about Jesus and Abraham as we summarize what we've said? Number one, we begin to understand God's love for us when we embrace the pain of sacrificing an only child. Number two, our personal faith in God will have an impact on those close to us. Number three, God tests our faith for our own benefit, not for His. And number four, our salvation comes by grace through faith and results in works and obedience. These are some of my takeaways from this passage anyway. I wonder what yours are. I hope you're discussing this with a small group so that you can press these truths into one another's lives. I'm loving this study. It's going to be a rich, rich study. I hope you'll stick with me. I hope you guys have an amazing week. I love you guys. And In the meantime, come back next week. We'll pick up right where we've left off with the next story from the Old Testament. Have a great week.